everyone uh, welcome back so um, today we're going to talk about uh, cancer immunology in our seventh lecture of part two uh, for the BMT 311 immunology uh, course now I got an interesting email from Google today I'm sure you're all keeping uh, well and safe uh, many of you who were stuck um, at the hostels are probably home now so I hope um, you're taking care and uh, enjoying your time using it wisely. Um, but yes, I got an email from Google. I just thought I'd share with you because I thought it was hilarious. So, so Google will send me emails about uh, my recent travels. And, and this month's travels um, basically has me visiting one place. And the highlight of my visit is Tesco <laughs> Jelutong. <laughs> uh, yes, life in, in a pandemic, right? Yes, but it's okay. Uh, everything turns out okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. So, good mantra for me. Um, anyway, as, as is with uh, the case of this uh, pandemic style life, we try to reduce our contact. And so, of course, you're watching this um, far away from me. And... Um, Let's let's just get started. Too much, too much, too much distraction. Um, yeah, trying to keep this lecture below thirty minutes. Okay, it's a short one anyway. So cancer immunology. Uh, it's interesting because when we talk about immunology, usually we're talking about uh, defending our bodies against uh, invaders, invaders from the outside. Um, but this lecture is is about dealing with the enemy within. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, how the normal cells become cancerous. So just a little bit of a refresher. I'm sure some of you have already learned about cancer or already know about cancer. I mean, cancer is such a, a widespread common thing now. Uh, everybody knows at least one person who has had cancer, uh, unfortunately. Um, so most of us have some baseline awareness about it, but we're going to go a bit more in detail about how this process starts. And then we're going to go more into the immune response and the role of the immune system in both eradicating and also helping the cancer spread. So a bit of a dual role that the immune response has. Um, and then we're going to go briefly into uh, applications of immunotherapy in cancer. So it's one type of therapy that can be used to treat cancer. And that's the one we'll talk about um, more. So what is cancer? So cancer is um, basically when cells no longer respond to normal growth control mechanisms. So they're not really doing anything wrong. They're not terrible cells. Um, all they want to do is keep growing. Now that sounds like not so bad, but it's actually quite bad because when something keeps growing without stopping, they start impeding the growth of other things and they start killing off other things. They take way too much for themselves. Um, and they never leave. So that's, that's the problem that we have uh, with cancer cells. The normal cycle for cells, as it is the normal cycle for everything else, is once you're born, then you will grow, and then you mature, and then eventually you die, you leave. Um, you give space for, for new things to come up and then go through their cycle. But um, the cancer cells are not like that. They've lost the ability to stop growing. Um, or rather, they've acquired the ability to grow uh, uncontrolled and almost, in a sense, immortally. Yeah, uh, good good book for anybody who wants to read about it is uh, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. So this this is the the woman who developed a cervical cancer, and her cell, cancer cell line was used um, for tissue culture. So they're called HeLa cells. So, so they're still growing until today, or some version of them are still growing until today because they're immortal. Um, yeah, so that's basically what makes a cancer cell cancerous is that they, they no longer respond to regulations for their growth. Um, when this happens, there's, they're first called a neoplasm or a tumor, um, but um, some of these tumors are not as immortal or they don't just keep growing, but they, they grow beyond what's normal, um, but they're still sort of limited. So they're called benign uh, growths. Um, but the ones that start continuing to grow and become invasive, which means they start intruding into other space and other um, territories, that's when they're considered malignant 
and, and that's what we actually call cancer. And once they dislodge from their original site of growth and they travel through the bloodstream or the lymph vessels and then they go to a new site and start growing there and conquering there, that's when we call uh, that the cancer is metastasized. That's usually in the later stages or, or less treatable stages of the cancer because once it's spread, it's quite hard for you to start targeting the, the treatment. So this is an example of how um, you'd have this uh, type of growth. I think this one's uh, the cancerous kind. It's, you can see it's sort of spreading and in, invading into this, the vessels. So a pictorial version of that description. So you have here the initially modified tumor cell. So this tumor cell does not seem very different from the others, but it's basically different because it has lost some of its uh, uh, growth regulation checks. Um, now it starts growing. Um, and it's growing uh, abnormally, but it's still confined to that kind of mass. So this is what we call a benign tumor. Now it starts eroding into um, the vessels or, or beyond the limitations uh, of that tissue. It's now considered invasive or cancerous. And then it starts going to the vessels, dislodging, traveling, going further away, and then starting a new uh, replication site that's considered metastasized. Right, so um, that's the general progression for cancer, but um, we have different types of cancers depending on which tissue they come from. So there are basically three main types. You've got carcinomas, and that's all tumors that... I'm recording a lecture! Sorry. Uh, how do I pause this? Pause it? No, I don't want to color. And we're back. Hey, what's going on? All right, so different types of tissues uh, give you the type of cancer. So carcinomas come from epithelial origins. So this thing, that's a lot of cancers. 90% of all of our cancers are carcinomas. So this includes skin, gut, epithelial lining, internal organs, glands, etc. 9% of the cancers are of, uh, of uh, bone marrow origin or hemopoietic cell origin. So this includes your leukemias, lymphomas, and myelomas. And then a much rarer type of cancer is sarcomas, which come from connective tissue, such as your bone, fat, and cartilage. So bone cancer, fat cancer, and cartilage cancer. Yeah. So a very, 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 very good friend of mine, his father, her father has just been diagnosed with bone cancer, and it's metastasized. So it's very rare cancer. So even though you don't know him, I hope you will give a prayer that he will be all right. Um, and uh, globally, most common cancers um, are sort of distributed by gender. And uh, women more commonly have breast cancer because we have more breasts usually. Uh, so it's about 25% of all female cancers. Um, then after that comes colorectal cancer, lung cancer, and cervic and utero cancer. So remember the HeLa cells I talked about? So that, that came from uh, a woman's uh, cervical cancer cell line. Um, men uh, more commonly have lung cancer, and then followed by prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and stomach cancer. So a bit of a difference there. So how do cells transform into malignancy? So we talked about the process, but what actually is driving this process? So this, I mean, it all starts with DNA damage, because we remember the DNA is our library, it's our recipe book, it's our guide on life. So if that one screwed up, everything else gets screwed up usually. So when there's damage to the DNA, when there's mutations, and this can be because there's been exposure to chemicals like formaldehyde or DDT or pesticides, and this is usually um, continuous exposure, yeah, not like one time, but over time when you get continuously exposed to these things, <coughs> apologies, they will start mucking up your, your DNA. No, they're called they're called mutations. Then there's of course uh, ionizing radiation. That one you don't need a, a very very long exposure, but if it's a sufficient dose, um, even one time, that can also induce or do some mutations. So so these are what we call carcinogens. <coughs> the other type of um, transformations come from infections. So this is where you have basically uh, the, the overlap between infectious and, and non-infectious disease. So cancer is a non-infectious disease, but it can have infectious origins. So certain viruses that can integrate into the host cell genome 
they can obviously induce mutations. So <coughs> a lot of the viruses mm, uh, like HPV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, Epstein-Barr virus, <coughs> they are able to convert certain proto-oncogenes into oncogenes. What are those? We'll talk about that in the next few slides. Now, usually when you have mutations, you have DNA repair mechanisms. So mutations are not that uncommon. It actually happens a lot, especially for, for cells that are rapidly dividing or, or replicating. Um, but you have uh, mechanisms to ensure that any errors are corrected so that they're not permanent. Um, so you need basically two things. You need something to trigger these mutations, and then you need something that actually makes the DNA repair, repair mechanisms to also fail. Um, so these these include a few a few types of genes actually um, that then together uh, allow a, a cell that should have normally you know grown matured and then died suddenly not grown and matured but just kept growing uh, in numbers um, and and um, never died basically. So let's talk about the cancer genes. So you've got the cancer genes that these these are the ones that we know um, play a role in whether or not certain cells become cancerous. So you have first the proto-oncogenes. They are basically um, uh, normal genes and they stimulate normal cell development. But then mutations to these proto-oncogenes lead to oncogenes. So again, these are normal genes. When they're normal, they're behaving normally, they're called proto-oncogenes. But then when they mutate, they become oncogenes. So, so these basically are genes that relate to the cell cell growth. So any changes to them can cause uh, cancer. Then you have tumor suppressor genes. So these genes actually stop the cell from multiplying. So their regular job is to make sure the cell does not grow um, or does not replicate. Uh, then you've got mutator genes. So th these are the ones that we talk about as being a part of the repair mechanism. So they ensure that the DNA replicates correctly and that uh, the DNA uh, repair happens. So when these new genes start mutating and they're not working, obviously you'll have a higher rate of mutations or uncorrected mutations. Um, so if you if you think about it in terms of a car uh, about to hit a, a brick wall called cancer, you have different things sort of stopping the car from hitting that wall. The first the first one is you've got normal genes uh, that are re regulated by tumor suppressor genes. Yeah, so the tumor suppressor genes is pressing that brake, making sure the car doesn't keep going. But then a mutation happens. Yeah, um, and then you have basically the active oncogene, so that will push um, the car closer to, to the cancer wall. But maybe the tumor suppressor gene is still working, so it's not going there yet. And then suddenly your tumor suppressor genes are also faulty. So you're not having anything to stop the growth, and then you have something to encourage the growth. So um, that gets closer to cancer. Um, and let's say you've also get you also get the faulty uh, repair genes, and together with the active oncogene, that then leads to your car hitting the cancer wall. So um, as we mentioned before. What are the triggers of these? These can be things like infections, so viruses that also carry oncogene sequences, uh, or they're induced um, by carcinogens and then cause mutation, or even um, certain genetic predisposition that makes uh, certain genes more vulnerable to being mutated. Um, so you've got, again, another picture, of basically a rep repetition of the same idea, right? You've got normal cells that have proto-oncogenes. That means they're behaving the way they should to regulate normal growth. And then you've got tumor suppressor genes, um, and they're responding to growth factors. But then, because it's been infected, the cell's been infected by a virus, you've got mutations to these proto-oncogenes, or the, the virus inserts an oncogene. So now the cell has transformed to having oncogenes. Um, which means they can now start proliferating um, unchecked, uh, especially if you also lose your tumor suppressor genes and any of your repair uh, mechanisms. So the, the, the whole idea um, is that it, it happens as a sequential uh, genetic alteration. So this is a model for metastatic colon cancer. So in, in this model, you have the normal cells lining the colon um, and then you have one that's kind of about to, to not be so normal 
so it starts um, losing or inactivating its uh, tumor suppressor genes so this is the APC one of the tumor suppressor genes and then it starts being able to grow uh, and then an oncogene becomes activated right so the KRAS becomes activated and then it's, it enters an intermediate uh, phase where it's still a tumor um, still kind of contained as a mass there um, and then it starts losing another tumor suppressor gene the DCC so it grows even further and then uh, finally it loses the TP53 and with all these tumor suppressor genes lost and that KRAS activated it eventually becomes cancerous starts invading um, aggressively right so now let's go into the features of the tumor so, so what, what's different about a tumor cell and a normal cell? For the immune system, everything relies on antigens, right? Your surface markers. Your surface markers will tell you to the immune system whether or not you are friend or fro foe, whether or not you should, they should do something to you, whether or not they should do something else. Um, so one thing that we need to remember is that cancer cells are our cells. So we are, they are self cells. So the immune system by default has been trained to ignore them remember what we learned in tolerance what we learned in autoimmunity it's a problem if your immune system responds to you because then it will start destroying you um so it, it it's it's supposed to ignore you right so it's it tolerates you um but there are certain things that changes in in a tumor cell it's no longer exactly like a normal a self cell or a normal host cell and this is where the immune system has a chance at actually identifying that these are now the hidden enemy yeah I really can't find it. Uh, can you give me your that has just take it. it just take it all right so where was I um, right so so the tumor antigens are the only way the immune system can identify that these cells are not normal and there are two main types of tumor antigens. One is the tumor-specific antigens, and then the other one is the tumor-associated antigens. Um, most of these tumors are actually uh, recognized through the self-MHC, um, and the tumor antigens recognized by the T cells um, basically are one of four groups. So they're either antigens encoded by the genes exclusively, uh, um, but ex exclusively expressed by tumors. So for example, viral genes, so if, if the cells were infected by the virus, it's carrying virus genes, um, or their antigens encoded by a variant form of a normal gene that's been mutated, um, or antigens that are normally expressed only at certain stages of development, but suddenly are present on a tumor cell, or if it's an antigen that is overexpressed. So even though it's technically a normal antigen, there's just too much of it, so that's not normal anymore. Um, so yeah, so basically, um, this, this picture can t give you a better idea of one of these four groups or three groups. So the normal cell is here. You've got the self peptide and the class one MHC. Um, and if there's mutations, then you might have, um, an altered self peptide. So that's the tumor specific antigen. So it's unique to the tumor. Then you've got the, uh, tumor associated antigen where because of the mutations, you have uh, an expression of a peptide that isn't normally there uh, at that stage in the development. So for example, oncophytopeptides. Um, or in the other case, it's an overexpression uh, of a normal protein. So the protein is normal, but too much of it is not. So these are the ways that um, they are marked a bit differently from, from normal cells. So. Tumor-specific antigens are basically unique proteins. So if you want to think about specific, unique, same, same. So they, they, they are only found uh, basically on tumor cells. So they can be quite different, um, but the only thing they have in common is they can induce T-cell-mediated rejection. Um, and often they are virally induced um, for especially the tumors. Um, so it, it'll have certain uh, virus-specific tumor antigens um, like the SKHPVE6 and E7, they will be commonly found in a lot of the cervical cancer cell lines. The other one that we talked about was the tumor-associated antigens. So these are not unique to cancer. Uh, again, they can be normal proteins. It's either that they are expressed at the wrong time or there's they are expressed in too high amount. Um, so 
two common uh, tumor-associated antigens are the alpha fetoprotein, AFP, and the carcinoembryonic antigens, the CEA. So these proteins are usually only expressed in the fetus. So once you are already you know, out of the womb and you're a growing adult, <clears throat> you wouldn't really have these type of antigens expressed on your cells unless they've become tumorous. Um, so how does the immune system respond to cancer? Well, first, we, we already know that there's a way for them to at least identify it because there are some antigens that are different. But then what do they do? Um, what, how do they actually respond to cancer? Well, um, in a loose way, uh, first, if there are viruses that are able to transform the cells, the immune system does its job and tries to destroy the virus. So that also prevents the cancer from happening or the transformation from happening. It also helps by eliminating pathogens. So pathogens in general, not even pathogens that can induce cancer, can actually uh, contribute to cancer if they're actually present for a long time and cause sort of a chronic inflammation. So um, <clears throat> one example I can think of is uh, the H. pylori, which is associated with uh, stomach cancer. Um, so because it's, it stays there and then it, it actually induces this chronic inflammation, so it's theorized that that also leads to development of cancer later on. So if the immune system can get rid of these pathogens, they also reduce the risk of developing cancer. Um, and then there's, of course, the actual direct uh, identification and elimination of the actual cancerous cells once the cancer has happened. So this involves immunosurveillance. Um, so the immunosurveillance, a branch of the immune system, will monitor and try to destroy any neoplastic cells or any new growth that it's not normal. So what are the um, main players in tumor eradication? So we have uh, the innate inhibitors, such as the natural killer cells, as well as certain uh, macrophages. They also can respond to tumors. Um, they'll produce lytic enzymes or reactive oxygen species. Uh, and, in, and another uh, cell type, eosinophils, has also been discovered to play a role. Uh, for the adaptive cell uh, immune response, uh, mostly it's the cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes that will um, help with tumor regression. B cells can also play a role by making anti-tumor antibodies. So the anti-tumor antibodies can help mark the cells, um, which then later allows the T cells to identify and, 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 and kill them. But sometimes these anti-tumor antibodies backfire and they actually block the antigens and uh, prevent the T cells from actually identifying the tumor cells. So that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work out right. Um, then you've got cytokines. Cytokines uh, can, can do a number of things. Um, in this case, the interferon gamma, uh, interleukin-12, they all have anti-cancer activities as well as tumor necrosis factor alpha. But tumor necrosis alpha can also promote the, the cancer. It depends uh, on, I guess, um, the, <clears throat> the microenvironment as well, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. So an important concept with immune response to cancer is this idea of immunoediting. Um, and this, this is actually where um, the way the immune response happens can actually both inhibit and then later enhance the tumor. Um, so this, this came up when people noticed that the tumors you take from immunocompetent animals, so wild type animals that have regular immune defenses, uh, when you take tumors from these animals and put it to a new host, they actually grew very, very aggressively. Um, but if you take tumors from immunodeficient mice, so these are mice that have been altered to not have immune defenses, um, these tumors, when you put it to a new host, they get rejected quite fast, which is kind of suggests that the one from the wild type is actually a much stronger type of cancer uh, cell. And the one from the immunodeficient one is the much weaker kind, which, which is kind of uh, strange, right? But um, this, this suggested that the tumors growing in, in the immunodeficient environment are actually more immunogenic, which means they're able to trigger the immune response better, um, and they're actually less resistant to being uh, eliminated. Um, so the fact that you have a, a functional immune system, or if you are immunocompetent, can actually exert um, an effect where you are selecting the cells that are more likely to survive um, and getting rid of the weaker ones. 
So, so repeat that again, and and maybe I'll give you a parallel example. So, uh, you may or may not have learned about this yet, but um, it's the same idea when you, when we talk about antibiotic resistance. So, with antibiotic resistance, it usually comes about because people take antibiotics, and let's say they don't finish the course, or they're taking antibiotics uh, when they don't even need it. So, what does the antibiotic do? The antibiotic is supposed to kill bacteria, right? So. More often, it'll just kill off the weaker bacteria. Um, and if you don't finish the course, then you'll leave the ones that are stronger to, to remain behind. Um, so now that there isn't all these weak bacteria taking up resources, taking up space, what happens to the stronger bacteria that survive? They now have all the space and all the nutrients they need to start growing rapidly. So they take over and they become the dominant population. And these are the ones that are resistant to the antibiotics which gives you the problem of antibiotic resistance. Same, same issue here. You probably have a, a group of cancer cells. Um, some of them have more mutations that make them more resistant, but the majority are probably more likely to be eliminated. So when you have the immune system attacking them, they'll kill off the ones that are weak, and then there'll be a few that are stronger, stronger or more resistant to being destroyed uh, will, will remain. So these are the ones that will start spreading and they will make up a new population that is much more aggressive and much more resistant to being uh, destroyed. So so this whole idea of the immune system actually causing this to happen is called immunoediting and it's basically proposed to take in three stages, uh, elimination, equilibrium and escape. So with elimination, first the immune system is just behaving the way it should, in which case it recognizes that this is a cancer cell or a tumor cell via the tumor antigens, and then they try to destroy. But in this process, some of the cells, some of the tumor cells, actually acquire mutations that makes them resist any process to be destroyed. Now in the second phase, the equilibrium, you've basically gotten rid of a lot of the um, abnormal cells, uh, at least the ones that weren't resistant, um, and then you have a f some low-level uh, cells that are abnormal uh, and more resistant, and they're, they're, they keep on growing, and the Im adaptive immune system response keeps on trying to kill them off. Um, but then you enter phase three, which is escape, where the tumor cells that are mutated now are able to grow quite aggressively, uh, and the immune system can no longer contain them. And in fact, it starts switching. Before, the immune response was very much anti-tumor, but now that the tumor has grown uh, quite quite. Uh, rapidly, some of the responses now actually help the tumor cells grow even further, so they become pro-tumor. So this this uh, image hopefully helps you understand it a little bit better. Let's say you start here with some healthy tissue, and then you've got some kind of transformation in some of the cells, either through can carcinogens or viral infection or what have you, and you start developing some, some tumorous cells uh, with some tumor antigens. So the tumor antigens will be detected when there is immunosurveillance by the immune system, and then you get uh, the, the players such as the CD8 uh, cytotoxic T cells, the natural killer cells, um, so they will come to target these cells. Um, and then you will, they will basically try to um, protect the healthy cells and, and stop the growth of the tumorous cells. Um, then you enter an equilibrium phase where they manage to kill off quite a number, except for the ones that have developed more mutations that are still able to grow. Um, so this is an equilibrium phase. Then we enter the escape phase where, where these guys, the ones that have developed more mutations that are able to grow more rapidly and uh, more uncontrollably, they start invading, um, and now the immune system cannot do that much against it anymore, and in fact, um, some of the cytokines that are produced now uh, by these other players, such CDL, CTLA4, uh, Tregs, so we know these are tolerant cells, so these tolerant cells start um, producing cytokines that reduce the immune response, which allows the cancer to proliferate even more. So the, this is basically how uh, the immune system plays a role, first trying to stop it, and then after that, it's sort of like, ah, can't do anything anymore, go ahead, go ahead, you know, be free. <laughs> um, so that, that, that basically is that dual role that the immune system uh, seems to play in, in cancer. Um, and, and a lot of it uh, is 
related to the ability of the tumor to to evade the immune system yeah so part of the trick is not being able to be recognized and then after that um, actually changing the way the immune system responds to them so this can be uh, first the MHC uh, expression is reduced so obviously um, that uh, allows for less um, uh, uh, surface expression and uh, detection so sometimes, very clever, they'll have these tumor-specific antigens, but instead of having them as markers because of the MHC uh, reduction, the tumor-specific tumor, uh, tumor antigens just becomes uh, secreted instead. So it's not going to be there marking them. Um, then you have um, subversion of apoptotic signals. So usually uh, the way the um, immune, uh, the T cells will, will act on the uh, cancer cells is that it will uh, trigger an apoptotic response. But the tumor cells will upregulate anti-apoptotic mediators, so then they won't um, have the necessary receptors to even be triggered to undergo apoptosis. And then, of course, we remember from the previous lectures that for, for the T cells to be um, activated, they need co-stimulation, right? Um, just having the antigen presented without co-stimulation will induce energy. So that's usually what happens as well. The tumor cells um, will uh, not be so immunogenic. They will not have the co-stimulatory molecules needed, so it'll just not um, trigger the, the T cell to be activated. Um, so that's that's how they they evade the immune system. So a few a few examples here about the uh, types of uh, MHC class on the cells. So the one that have a high class one MHC carrying the tumor antigens will first be targeted and be killed off. Um, but the ones that have a progressive loss of the MHC class one molecule, they won't be able to stimulate the T cells. Or let's say they don't have the necessary co-stimulatory molecules, then the T cell won't be activated. Um, so this this allows for the tumor to escape, immune surveillance and immune uh, response. Um, so we talked about chronic inflammation just now, yeah. So chronic inflammation, how does that actually uh, cause cancer? It it actually can create a pro-tumor microenvironment. If you remember from the previous uh, images, there are some cytokines that will suppress the tumor and then some cytokines produced that will actually encourage the growth. Um, so in this case, this chronic inflammation can actually increase certain cellular stress signals um, that first uh, lead to more mutation, but then the, okay, yeah. And then there can also be growth factors and cytokines that are secreted that actually um, allow them to respond to these uh, growth stimulators, so makes them grow even more. Um, and inflammation is actually pro-angiogenic. So if you remember in inflammation, you want more of these immune cells to be able to access the site. So, so the blood vessels will naturally uh, be growing and allowing for, for, more, for more entry um, uh, to that tissue. Uh, and it works the opposite way as well. So when there's inflammation and you're trying to bring in all these uh, immune cells into the site, you're actually giving an escape route to um, the cancer cells of that site to go into the blood vessels and then be carried off. Almost done now. We'll talk about cancer therapy now. Um, and there are basically uh, four main types. Uh, we've got chemotherapy. So these are chemicals that you try to use to block DNA synthesis and cell division. They're very general. That's why they also have impact normal host cells. Hormonal therapies as well. Um, they, also reg they also change the uh, growth stimulations. Again, very, very general, uh, very broad, so they will affect normal host cells. Um, and then, uh, it's not mentioned here, but radiotherapy, they can be a bit more targeted because it's going to be based on location. Um, uh, but then there are also targeted therapies like small molecule inhibitors of cancer, and then immunotherapies that induce or enhance the anti-tumor immune response. That's what we'll be talking about in a bit more detail. So cancer immunotherapy are designed to help eliminate the tumor by reviving, initiating, or supplementing the in vivo anti-tumor immune response or by neutralizing inhibitory pathways. That's a mouthful. Um, but they're basically anything that you use, um, usually, usually using antibodies or other cytokines to change the way the immune system uh, responds to the tumor to help eliminate it and prevent it growing any further. So this can be monoclonal antibodies, cytokines, or introduction of tumor-specific T cells, 
or therapeutic vaccines, which then help stimulate an anti-tumor immune response, or manipulation of co-stimulatory signals, uh, or it can be a combination of these. Um, so this is uh, just one example of a monoclonal antibody specific for idiotypic determinants on B lymphoma cells. Um, so this is basically um, how, how they, they try to, to come up with this therapy. First, they inject an anti-idiotype antibody into the patient. Um, then they take the B lymphoma cells from the patient um, and they fuse it uh, for, with a hybridoma to secrete the B lymphoma antibodies. Then they inject it into mice. Okay, so you, they they basically need more of these antibodies um, for the lymphoma, and then they make a monoclonal against it by injecting it into mice. So you you would have learned how to make polyclonals uh, in the um, lab practicals if it had gone through. Um, polyclonals we use rabbits. Um, if you want to make monoclonals, usually you inject it in mice. Um, then they harvest the spleen cells and the mouse myeloma cells, and then they um, take the uh, antibody isotype hybridomas um, and discard these, but then they take the anti-idiotype uh, hybridomas, um, and these antibodies specific for the idiotypic determinants are not the monoclonal antibodies uh, that they can use for treatment. Um, this is another example of uh, Cipulu cell T, a prostate cancer vaccine. Um, and what they do is they take the dendritic cells from the patient's blood, they culture it with a fusion protein, prostate cancer specific antigen PAP, and the antigen presented cell activated cytokines such as the GM CSF. Um, then they re infuse the DCs uh, to stimulate the T cells um, against the PAP. So the PAP is the pro prostate cancer antigen. So they basically stimulate the dendritic cells externally and then re-insert re, um, or reintroduce these DCs into the patient so that the T cells can then respond um, and get stimulated and then target the, the cancer cells, uh, the prostate cancer cells. So this is, in a sense, a prostate cancer vaccine. Um, so a few more uh, examples, I'm not going to go into them in detail, but let, let's just say this one uses the um, CTL activation. So this uses the co-stimulatory CD80 molecule to address the problem of tumor cells not having co-stimulatory molecules. Um, and this one uses uh, GMCSF transfected tumor cells. So um, this means the um, the tumor cells secrete high levels of the CSF, which will activate the DCs um, and then um, present the tumor antigens to the T cells uh, and allow them to be destroyed by the um, CTLs, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And that's the end. I don't know why I didn't have a recap, but let's just recap very quickly. So we learned about uh, how cancers develop. Typically, there has to be a trigger which mutates the DNA, which then loses um, either tumor suppressor genes or the, the repair genes or activates the proto-oncogenes into becoming oncogenes. Yeah? Um, and then when these happen, um, the immune system tries to respond by recognizing tumor antigens. So these can be tumor-specific or tumor-associated antigens. But um, this process is not perfect and that's where we talked about the immunoediting effect where first the immune system can eliminate some of them but then um, it ends up actually selecting for the more aggressive or the more mutated cells, which then um, are able to escape and grow more rapidly. And then the immune system kind of backfires and starts producing cytokines that actually encourage the growth of the cancer cells. But um, to treat the cancers, we're also trying to use the immune system. Um, so we use things like monoclonal antibodies or cytokines or develop co-stimulatory molecules, which help to address some of the limitations or the problems that the immune system has naturally um, when they're trying to deal with the, the, the cancer or the tumor cells. And that's it. Um, so I'll see you in the next lecture.